This is Humble Mind. Today we're speaking with Alan Boyle, who's the founder of Saltwater Consulting, and he's going to explore with us exactly what it means to design a process, what it means to have a bias for action, what it means to be obsessed about customers, and a few other secrets and principles that he picked up during his time working with Amazon. I think you'll really enjoy this one. If you're curious about our community and exactly what it is that we do at Humble Mind, join us. Check us out at humblemind.co. Now, here's the conversation. Enjoy it. Yeah, very warm welcome to Humble Mind. Thanks for joining us, Alan. Not at all. It's good to it's good to be on and uh, to chat to you. Awesome. You have a very soothing voice, Alex. So kind of you can put anybody at ease, you know. Oh, uh, good. Well, just don't fall asleep. It's just. <laughs> no, no, I won't. I won't. <laughs> I'd love to hear a bit about your your background, just for everyone's context. I mean, I I'm I know you know kind of where you come from, and and, and the fact that you're also a fellow South African. We're everywhere, aren't we? Um, but yeah, maybe just your background quickly on 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 kind of where you've been, where you started out, and what led you to currently your work with Saltwater Consulting, just for some context. Okay, so um, I'll try and keep it as short as possible without going into too much detail. But I was born in France to an Irish um, mother of South African father. Um, that was back in 76. And then a few years later, we got, I think, kicked out of the country for obvious reasons and uh, back to Simonstown and spent some time in Cape Town, um, spent a lot of my childhood in Cape Town and then also Johannesburg and stuff like that. So uh, um, after school and school wasn't exactly most I wasn't the most academic guy in town um school was quite interesting um you know I, I, I struggled with maths I struggled with science um and and really didn't enjoy the school thing I moved around a lot I went to seven different schools uh, dad was in logistics and all over the show so that's served me better later in life as I've adapted to new things and change um and can help with change programs uh, and I suppose at the time it wasn't too bad, but uh, it is, you know, when you're um, growing up and you're two years before finishing school and you're being moved from one end of the country to the next, that wasn't fun. But uh, it, 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 it's probably um, helped build some resilience along the way. Uh, after that, I went to, um, I, I actually went straight into work. Um, I went into logistics um, and uh, into fleet management. Uh, I worked for a company for about three or four years there. And uh, then I decided that the IT bug had bit a little bit. It was just starting out. I mean, people were really starting to use systems to improve their processes. And in fleet management, we had a number of um, trucks on the road being delivered around South Africa, fresh produce and everything like that, refrigerated trucks. And uh, there was quite a lot of uh, planning around that. And they implemented a system. And this was everything was handwritten back in those days, and uh, they implemented a system where the with GSM, where the a mobile technology, where the, where the trucks could actually be, we could do some better route planning, and we could start mapping where they were going, and also stop trucks from going into areas that they shouldn't be going into, you know, hijack zones, things like that. Real struggles in South Africa, if you know. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, that that kind of led this me to this. Well, hang on. This is interesting. You know, technology can really make change change the way you do things. And I did some IT studies. I went into sort of technology and planning and systems engineering type studies, and then went to Saudi Arabia. Then to to it worked with Citibank for a while, uh, helping them roll out a new um, network. And then from there to Dublin. This is back. This is Dublin in, in two thousand, and uh, I was a, an IT guy working for a financial services company. We optimized a lot of their systems. We consolidated five or six companies from different parts of Dublin into one area. And again, just through this time, understanding how potentially technology can Im improve the way you do things. Mm -hmm. uh, so fast forward a little bit. I went back to South Africa. I joined an internet service provider, spent a number of uh, years there and moved into an operations role from sales. I was like the, probably the only COO with a, a revenue number on my head, you know, so uh, at the time, but it was quite interesting because the whole idea was to get the customer, onboard the customer, keep the customer. So I looked after that end of the business while the CTO looked after the technology and the infrastructure networks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, I learned a lot about operations and, and 
I've always had this obsession for customers, and I'll get into that in a second. Uh, I then came back. So you're probably not following along at this stage because it's confusing. But so around 2018, I uh, started in Amazon in Ireland. So we decided, my wife is Irish. We decided after 10 years back in South Africa, we wanted to come back to Ireland. And I joined AWS, Amazon Web Services. It's their cloud part of the business. And um, used to be a very small part of Amazon is now quite a big part of Amazon. And uh, I spent a number of years there working on a few global programs. Um, I was kind of senior, senior leader in there in Dublin and uh, really optimizing their support operations um, business. Uh, And then in 2020, March 2020, um, just before all the shutdowns, I left Amazon and started a consulting business. Oh, what a time. (laughs) Perfect timing, perfect timing. So Saltwater Consulting was uh, very much the idea there was I learned a lot over my career as a COO, um, as a senior manager at Amazon, where they really use operational efficiencies well, I learned a lot about operations. And even though I wouldn't like to bury my head in operations all day long, the idea to enable companies and Mm. teach them how to fish or teach them how to be more efficient, that really appealed to me. And that kind of led me to saying, well, do you know what? I'm probably not cut out for a a big corporate or tech company like Amazon. I think I joined far too late. If I joined when I was younger, I might've had a lot of a longer tenure there. Um, So it didn't really suit me. I learned a lot there and I just thought it was time to start Mm. my own thing and teach companies how to fish basically and Mm. and using operational excellence. So that's, that's my story really in a nutshell. Is it, I mean, we're going to get into some of your, your, your thinking and your methodology, which I, which I love the think design implement in a moment, but is it useful having a working definition of operations for us? Because I think often people who are at least not operationally minded or don't work in operations think that it's this big kind of blob, you know, it's somewhere between the, you know, IT support and tech and, you know, people doing equations in the back, in the back office, you know, so is, is there a useful way that maybe you've found or, or in your experience to talk about how, what we talk about when we reference operations, because it's such a massive area and it's the yeah, it room of the business, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, Operations is actually you can the, the the other word there or the 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 verb would be operationalizing right so operationalizing a um a, a, an area and you can operationalize everything from sales yes. it's all about your metrics your processes um but to sum it up operations is the integration of all the functions in a business so it's, it's so so you would have you, you, yes you have your sales. And you have your um, your marketing and your brand, and, the, and and your CEO might come into a business and look after the north. You know, this is where the north star is. Here's the culture. Here's mm. where we're going. And they may be more strategic. They may be more external facing. Operations is the integration of all the functions, the the, the way the functions can actually hand over processes from one to the other. So sales into customer projects, into onboarding, into support, into customer retention right through to finance mm. um so so i would look at operations as, as uh you you've got your functional owners so you might have a head of sales you might have a head of finance or head of projects or if you're in a in a product business it might be head, a head of manufacturing whatever it is operations ties it all together yes. and generally uses i mean in layman's terms would use a scorecard or a, a like a a, a dashboard where the key metrics align across the business. So you need to know that if leads are not coming in to the sales part of the organization, that that's actually going to create slack or too much capacity in your, your onboarding or your, your, your mm. project delivery team. So all the teams need to be looking at each other's metrics. And I think that's key. And often we see in businesses, the functional owners look at their own metrics and don't really worry about the story that's going on outside that. And that's where bottlenecks can happen. That's where right. constraints can happen. So that's really the idea behind yeah. operations. And uh, it's not always the first um, role that gets created because in a small scrappy right. startup, everybody has to do everything right. Mm. Um, so that's kind of, uh, it, it's something that evolves as a business needs more structure. It's a great way to just think about operations. And, I, and, I've, and I've always kind of thought about it in the way you've, you've said, but it's great to define it like that, where it's not its own vertical, like sales or finance, which has its own set of kind of defined parameters, but rather the the sort of the glue that that really blends all of that together and makes it work and makes it kind of work in an interdependent kind of way as well, right? It's like the 
it's the lattice structure that holds it all together, really. So if anything, yeah. each department really has an operational interest as well in order for it to just function normally. So Exactly. Each, yeah. each department should have an operational interest. And I think a lot of the time when businesses, again, are smaller, everybody does what they need to do. I mean, especially in a startup, you know, in a scrappy startup, you'll hire people that are jack of all trades. That's what they're meant to be. So you might have somebody doing cold calling in the morning and then organizing the event the next day and then going to the printers to pick up a, you know, t-shirts for something, yeah. you know, they, they do everything and they have to do everything. And you've got the CEO jumping in dealing with customer problems and you've got the CEO on the support email. It, that's the way it works. Mm. But then once you build that structure, you need to, um, you, you actually need to start thinking, okay, right. Sales needs to do what sales do and they do it well, but we need to start creating functional yeah. owners yeah, yeah. and then operations then turn around and say, right, this is how you operationalize sales and the various other things so that there's harmony between the business units. Absolutely. Yeah. I see a, I see a hand up. Yeah. I see Bruce. a hand down. Is it appropriate to ask a question? Right yeah, now? of course. Go for it. Alan, you've made a very good point because, um, you know, I'm involved in uh, lots of um, startups and small to medium kind of enterprises. Operations is the core, right? You screw that up and you get lots of stuff wrong all over the place. But it's actually one of the lowest ranking areas in the business from the startup perspective, you know, and we look yeah. at it because we always say that the operations is such a quarter, but it's down here. Yeah, we're, we're looking at the marketing, we're looking at the sales, and we're handling all the finance stuff and the reporting. You, it's a very good point. Isn't it bizarre? It's one of the most core parts of the business, but it's, it's one of the lowliest ranks um, for quite a considerable amount of time. I'm interested in your view on that. Mm. Yeah, it's a good comment. And again, I, I always talk about my role, Saltwater Consulting, is to help companies go from scrappy to structured, you know, from that scrappy scale up to a struct, from a scrappy startup to a, sca uh, a structured scale up. Um, I don't think you need to focus too much on operations early on when you have to be scrappy. You know, you've got some funding, you've got to get product market fit. You've got a little bit of hustle culture where you've got to get stuff done, especially in the startup space. Um, I, I think the best operational thing you could do is put in some key metrics and put it, make sure that there's a very good North Star and that all the team are aligned to it. So in the startup space, you probably heard this through Google and other big tech companies, the, the concept of uh, OKRs or objectives and key results like smart goals. So if you can get some key goals in place early on and just say to all the teams, you need to align around these goals in some way. It doesn't matter if it's a little bit scrappy to start. You don't want people looking at scorecards and and solving for operational efficiencies at the very beginning. And normally when you're building a scale up, you don't have necessarily, you, you're not looking at efficiencies. You're looking at getting that product out, landing the first customer, getting some sort of revenue and meeting those, um, you know, whatever metrics are set for the business. Mm. A little bit later, once you start implementing teams and you're now having to put functional owners in place, that's when it actually, you're right, Bruce, becomes, it, it's it, it's core, absolutely. Um, and it doesn't always get the uh, the platform that it needs. I think that's the challenge. And I think you, you, you need to build that, you've got to build that culture, that operational culture or rigor into the business. So, you know, sales people turn around and say, oh, I don't worry about operations, but, you know, they're all asking for the biggest and fanciest CRM system. And I say, well, if you don't put anything into that CRM system, you're going to get nothing out. So the big question I always ask companies is, so what? Okay, sales, you want a flashy new HubSpot CRM system. Um, what are you putting in and why does it matter? You know, do you want a single source mm. of truth for a customer? Do you want the CRM so that you can maintain the customer? Like, why do you want this? So asking questions helps them really uncover what, what is true to them, what metrics are important to them. And then if you can build them into the whole benefit, if you can help the various teams understand why the metrics are important, um, whatever, the metrics specific to their I I environment, we can talk about customer yeah. onboarding metrics, we can talk about other things. But little things that are important, you can actually get them to, to really work towards keeping those metrics green. Um, and, and, and I think that's really, that, that, that's key. It's just building that culture and letting, know, letting every person in the business know that they actually need to operationalize their own departments. It's, uh, you hit on a word there, um, culture. And, um, I would love to dive in. I've been really curious for the last couple of days leading up to this to, to, to kind of dive into what you learned specifically from Amazon. Um, and how you now not only you know bring that into your own practice, but some of the 
some of the things that maybe surprised you or, you know, interested you or um, kind of stood out to you in your time at Amazon and how they were able to build exactly that, that operational culture. Yeah. Because it seems that kind of just reading between the lines of what you're saying, operations is really not a department or even a function of the business. It's, it's sort of this, this kind of, you know, these cogs that seem to turn together that the whole business has an interest in making sure happens and happens in a certain way that brings about efficiency as a function of just what this culture does and what it what it lives itself as a culture. So yeah, I, I would love to explore that with you. Yeah, and Amazon has, I mean, okay, firstly, there's mixed feelings. People to talk about it as being quite a toxic place to work. It's a tough place to work. It really is tough. And there's a fire hose of information coming at you. And, um, you know, you've got to be quite disciplined in turning, deciding what work you do, what work you you, you don't take on. Um, and you can very quickly get into where I was, you know, that that's a burnout stage where you're working every hour that they send you and you're just trying to do everything. So, but in saying that, one of the things they've had since the very beginning is their, their concept of LPs or leadership principles. Uh, and I think they have 16 now. I think they might have had 14 when I was there. Um, they evolve from time to time, but generally they are the the, the guiding values in the business. And they very pu they publicize, they write books about the Amazon leadership principles. Mm. And they'll have various things. Now, the leadership principles, this, when I was there, there was 14 of them. One of them, obviously, naturally, is customer obsession. Um, and they're obsessed about customers. And I can give an example around that, uh, how I thought I was customer obsessed, but failed you know, um, at it. Um, Not obsessed enough. Quite, <laughs> no, no, it was just it's just my approach. And it's actually, um, I'll, I'll get into it in a second. But the leadership principles, they have other principles like disagree and commit, um, dive deep. So really diving into the data. Mm -hmm. uh, they expect their leaders to be very broad, but then be able to go straight into the weeds on an issue if they need to. So all of these leadership principles act as levers. And um, not necessarily to be weaponized, to use it against somebody else, but they came into every part of the business. So when I was interviewed, I would have had six or seven interviews there, and each interviewer spoke to two leadership principles. And they were asking me um, situation type questions, maybe about my technical background or my ability to lead a team or whatever, but they wanted me to demonstrate a leadership principle. Um, and they, they, there was 14 of them. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but they have these values in a business, but the values work for them. They become these big operational cogs in the business, uh, which is quite interesting. A lot of companies talk about their values. And I, when I go and consult with businesses, I say, right, what's your mission? What are your values? And they're like umming and they're tripping over themselves and they're pulling something out of the drawer saying resilience. Uh, innovation, but they're not living the values. I think mm. the thing with what I saw is Amazon is it's it's built, it's baked into their everything they do. And I think that was quite interesting because when you go to a meeting, you can be halfway through a meeting and somebody said, you're not demonstrating a bias for action here. You know, so which is one a of the bias values. for action. Is that yeah? So oh. that was one of the leadership principles. So so bias for action means you've got a bias for action. You get stuff done, you know, you 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 move I love forward. That. But then there's another principle called dive deep. So you're very analytical. Mm. So sometimes what happens is these 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 um these leadership principles conflict with each other. And you know, I might be coming into a room saying, you haven't you, you're not demonstrating um bias for action. You're not moving quick enough on this problem. And they'll turn around and say, well, I need to dive deep. I actually need the data before I can make a decision. So mm. sometimes they work against each other. But the whole idea is that these leadership principles help you say, right, well, should I be doing going a bit quicker? Do I need to go into more weeds? What do I do? And they get used in everything. So when we when promotions happen, what leadership principles does this person demonstrate? When you have a conversation in a meeting and a meeting starts going off tangent, they'll bring the leadership principles in. Even at the water cooler, when you're talking about other staff, you you bring in the leadership principles they demonstrate. Like that's a really good leader. Uh, he demonstrates customer obsession like we've never seen before. And it's baked into wow. everything. And when you've got these very, very strong values that run the business, it's very easy to build around that because you're referring to them all the time. Um, so the culture is yes. quite strong there. It's do, quite do, strong do, there. Do you know, uh, just out of interest, do you know how these values are kind of instilled and incentivized maybe amongst the senior leadership? I mean, is it is there a way that they 
somehow tie some of the performance paid directly to how they live these values? Because clearly you've got these diehard kind of, you know, leaders who are doing what they need to be doing and they are absolutely, they're customer obsessed, but they're also clearly sort of company obsessed as well. How do you yeah. get them to live that where to the point where now they're talking about that at the water cooler? It's, it, it just lives right through the business. That's why, that's why it works. Um, and the senior executives, the very, very senior teams, so the team on, um, you know, Jeff Bezos's direct reports, every number of years would go, or at the time he was not, he's no longer sort of fully involved in the business. Andy Jassy's moved into that spot, but uh, they, um, they would go off site and they would question the values and they'd say, are these values still serving us? Do we need to bring in more values? So there's been a lot more work around governance and compliance and, yes. um, looking after the workforce. So they've introduced uh, values around that. But at, yeah, at the very beginning, let's let's say customer obsession. I'm going to go back to that. Jeff, in his very first meetings, used to have a chair in the room. He'd have an empty chair in the room. And with his leadership team, if anybody was sort of not demonstrating customer, he would say, that's the customer in that chair. They're in the boardroom with us. Mm. And if anybody started going on a on different tan tangent, he would say, we're not thinking about the customer. Um, and those stories filter down to the newest person joining. The onboarding is very intentional. Like a mythology. The onboarding. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so we, we would have a very, very well thought out onboarding plan, maybe 100 days or more, where you actually study the leadership principles, you study how to do hiring, you join courses, you every morning you're given sort of little nuggets of information around mm -hmm. here's a good example of leadership principles so they really instill that in you early on um and it's it's taken very seriously it's, it's as i said it's baked into every part of the business um even you know in aws you would work with partners um so let's say you'd work with sap or you'd work with microsoft or other partners on on technology that that needed to serve a certain customer that required both Amazon and other partners to work on. And the partners would understand our leadership principles. They would understand it's it's, it's the way of working. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's some me mechanisms that can filter out from the leadership principles, um, which you can use in smaller teams. And uh, one of those is called tenets. Now, tenets is a bit of a biblical term, but uh, uh, tenets is it's, it's like values or shared behaviors. Mm. Uh, and teams at Amazon are encouraged when they put the team together. So let's say there's a new team that's going to go and start building Alexa, for example. That Alexa team, that founding team will agree their tenets. What are their tenets? Um, they, they'll have four or five shared behaviors that they work on, that they hold each other accountable to. So there's a big, big play on not only following the core leadership principles, the core values, but also yes. the, um, the team's almost commit and contract. And I love that. And I bring that into all the companies I work with. I kind of say to the teams, what are your shared behaviors? Because mm. if they can agree on the behaviors saying we'll, we'll um, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, I was working with a team in, in the UK and I was trying to connect six IT teams that were operating in silos. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the security team was operating very differently to the way the support team was, the production team, the engineering team, all these IT teams are coming together. And we were trying to operationally align these teams. And we worked with each of the teams and said, look, we need to develop a set of tenets for this group. Okay. And uh, one of the tenets was, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds like a silly little tenet, but it's a hugely important one when the engineering team are full of ego. And they're shutting down the conversation every time a poor guy in support was asking a question saying, hey, hey, how does this work? And it was also, you know, it was almost extinguishing the introverts in the room that didn't want to ask a question. Yeah. So by actually creating a tenet saying there's no such thing as a stupid question, you're encouraging the quiet people to speak up without being reprimanded by that egocentric engineer that kind of thinks he knows it, knows it all. And you're also helping that engineer realize that, hang on, this is our shared behavior. So allow that question and be patient and be open to that question because that question may drive the conversation forward in a different way. That's an example of how you can use shared behaviors. And then once you've got the shared behaviors in place and everybody knows where their North Star is and where they're going, um, then it becomes very easy to layer in operational KPIs yes. and goals and all those other things because the team know how they operate. 
it's also it's also something that it's brilliant because it's simple, firstly, but also because it creates this kind of container of psychological safety, right? If someone feels that, look, I really do have a problem, but I'm I'm not going to bring it to the rest of the team because I don't want to be lampooned or I don't want to be mocked or you know whatever the 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 prevailing attitude is. But now, if you're putting there as a rule that you're safe because any question you ask is not only good for you but it's good for the rest of the team, um, yeah. and changing that behavior as a as a kind of a rhythm uh, is then something that everyone everyone adapts to by making it a kind of a, a behavioral rule or like a principle for for how to yeah. behave. Yeah, really, really clever. And, yeah. and, and and you do it with the team. So, you know, if, if if you're working with teams, you invite the whole team in and you say, we're going to write a set of behaviors that work for us. We're not going to have too many, but we want to have a number that we all, that make us tick so that people outside the room, if we had to explain that behavior to them, they would say, yeah, that's true. Absolutely true. That you can see that team lives that every day. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, oh, so I, yeah, sorry. No, carry on, carry on. I was just going to say, so, you picked up all of these learnings at Amazon, um, for better, for worse, hectic place to work at, but definitely the kind of place that, you know, because it's, it goes at 200 miles an hour, you're going to be picking things up. And obviously that's influenced a lot of your, your current consulting. And so I'd love to, unless you wanted to talk about anything else about Amazon, I'd love to go into your methodology, you know, think, design, implement, because everyone wants to create a phenomenal customer experience, right? Everyone wants to onboard their customer um, and, you know, keep them around for the long term. But I think the operationalizing of that is often what people miss, especially maybe in smaller businesses as well. Um, and a lot of the people in Humble Mind and the community are, are often single business owners or they're coaches and they, they have an even greater need to operationalize what they do because a lot of the time there's no one else. So they've got to set up very clear and direct processes on what to do so that customers aren't left hanging by a thread. So yeah, I'd love to hear, maybe just talk us through your steps and then maybe how we can see how to apply some of those specifically with smaller businesses. Um, because I think that's often where it's really most needed. Yeah. And, you know, I think as a small business, even as, you know, I'm, I'm a small business myself, I work as an advisor to companies and help them scale. Right. Or I work as a fractional COO, but I've got to think about my own planning and my own quarterly planning. And I try and follow the similar types of ways of working that I implement with my customers, almost to practice it. Even though I might be a team of one, it doesn't matter. You still have to put that, that, um, um, the, 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 a few systems and structures in place. Yeah. So think, design, implement, um, you know, very much the think comes from, uh, when I go and work with companies, I want to understand what the problems are first. So I, I've taken a design thinking approach. I was very fortunate to do a course in design thinking as part of a master's program. I did an elective and we, I was over in Hyderabad in India and we did a, 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 a course on design thinking. And I wanted to take some of the elements there of you not necessarily going into fix the problem. You're not necessarily going in there to solve a problem or provide a solution. You just want to, you want to ideate. So you want to meet with a team, run a little bit of diagnostics and see what trends come up. So typically my think process involves me going in and meeting with a team. It might be a number of the senior leaders. It might be a few individual contributors, mid managers, whatever it is. And then asking them a number of questions, which will give me an operational uh, health, like almost an organizational health score for, for, for the business. Uh, and just really ask them, you know, that usual, what should we start doing? What should we stop doing? If you could wage a ma ma wave a magic wand, what would you like to see change in the business? And really start just picking up the pulse of the business. Mm. That's the thing. And then what I would do is I'd take that diagnostics report and say, right, well, this is what I'm seeing. You know, your values are pretty strong, but um, you, you don't ch check your metrics weekly, for example. So maybe that's something we need to start looking at. Or you're only doing an annual goal setting thing you're not doing a quarterly goal setting thing if you did quarterly you could probably get more done or when you set your goals you set 50 goals every quarter and you only achieve none of them right so less is more that's my approach on everything so right, right rather every leader just one goal each and if every leader is dealing with one thing each a quarter suddenly you get to the end of year and you've really moved the dial so for me it's all about less is more and then really making, putting an emphasis on those goals, saying that's your what you need to focus on. Um, spend at least four or five hours outside your business as usual every week, thinking about your goal, working on your goal, mm. really putting time into, put time in your calendar around your goal. 
Because if you're spending four or five hours a week over 12 weeks of a quarter, you're going to get a lot done. But if you pick up, open up your email on a Friday morning and the first curveball comes in, you're naturally going to go and solve that curveball. So you're yeah. going to end up working on business as usual and you won't hit goals. So that that's kind of, I, 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 that's the think process. Just really understand where in the business there's potential errors. Mm. The design is then saying, right, well, let's get you thinking big, where you need to be in 10 years, what your values are, what your market, basically a strategic document. And the design piece is implement the strategic document with a team, where, where you want to go, but then turn that into an execution, um, an execution plan. Mm. So strategy is great execution a lot of companies don't get right so i'd spend a few days with the with a, with a leadership team saying right what's your go-to market where do you want to be in 10 years from now where do you want to be three years from now uh what what are the three unique identifiers the three things that make you stand apart from the rest of your competitors or the rest of the market mm. and really get them focused on that and and then say right you've got your behaviors you've got your north star in terms of where you want to go we know we, we've got you've got your mission. We know what makes you unique. We know what your go to market strategy is. Now let's start working through what are the things you want to try and achieve this year or this quarter to get you to that 10 year plan. Mm. And then we turn that into a smart goal or a metric or a KPI or dashboard or whatever. And we make sure that that team works towards that every week of the every week of the year. Uh, that's the that's the design piece. So get them a strategic doc. That, that is executable. So they almost have a plan, a blueprint. Uh, you looked at the Lego Land Rover in the back there. It's uh, you know that, that Lego book that you use to build that Land Rover. That's the plan we want them to have. Almost a paint by numbers. This is where you're going to go. Mm. Don't deviate from that. Um, and then the implement is really me hand-holding. Joining meetings. You know, when I work with, with scale-up companies, it might only be one or two days a month. Uh, I might join their weekly management meeting. I might chair their meeting. I might help them with interviewing. I might look at their dashboards. So every month might be something different, but I'll bring them through this journey of operationalizing their business. And that's the implement piece. So yeah, that's, so that's, awesome. that's how it works. I that's love how it. Works. So, uh, it's, I, so, so it's, yeah. So in terms of consulting, like think is it's, it's, it's a one or two day engagement with the team. The design is a bit longer. And then the implement is an ongoing 12 to 24 month plan. Just something that stood out for me in the process that you were going through now is that so much of what seems to be, um, guiding the kinds of conversations that I find on YouTube and in podcasts, especially around small businesses and how to set up your small business is that it's all about kind of getting to the point where you can sell and start selling as quickly as possible. And process is really just a, just something that kind of facilitates that. And it really doesn't matter if it's ugly. And like you said, if it's scrappy in the beginning, it's fine. But at the same time, there is a point you reach where the process itself becomes part of the experience that a customer might see or a part of what they see. And the more that we kind of skip over that and sort of like, yeah, we'll kind of get it right on the way rather than taking that time out to think about it like, no, I'm going to take these three hours now and specifically think what are those values? Do I have the bias for action? Do I have those Amazonian kind of approaches to this? And, and then let that dictate the action. And it's such, it seems like it's such a, a healthy and very welcome, different way of looking at it especially once again, from a sort of a, maybe a smaller business owner where you're all about just bringing in revenue, you know, and get, get to the customer. But that's more about kind of like, you know, um, ship the cupcake and not the wedding cake. doesn't matter if it's a piece of shit, you know, let's just, let's just get going so long. And then, you know, we kind of work on it on the way, but you're saying, well, rather spend more time thinking a lot more deeply and almost challenge your own thoughts on that. And then consciously design that process. Because if anything, a lot of the time people don't think about designing a process. A process kind of is just yeah. this, you know, chunky equation of things that happen, you know. But if you're actually consciously yeah. designing or creating something, it's a totally different way of looking at it. Yeah. And you know what, Alex? I'm conscious of the fact that the the headline for this was um, talking about customer onboarding. And uh, we, 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 we haven't touched really on that yet. But uh, yeah, the process is important. And, and you know what? A lot of companies are scared about designing the process. The first time that they, they bring me in is that we don't have any processes. We need you to help document the processes. And I go back to the thing. If the company knows where they're going and they've got the organizational behaviors in place, 
mm. and they've got some goals in place, the process mapping becomes easier. Yes. The organizational, the organizational chart is also quite important. A lot of people do an org chart and say, right, CEO, COO, sales guy, product guy, but they don't do an accountability chart. And the accountability chart is key because mm. each role needs to have five or six responsibilities. So if you're the salesperson, you're responsible for revenue, you're responsible for onboarding customers, whatever those four or five key responsibilities are. Once you've got an org chart in place, the process mapping becomes quite easy because it's like writing a book. You say, right, we've got our org chart. Those are the chapters, the function areas, the you know, chapters of the book. We now need sales to go and write their part of the book. And then once everybody writes the book based on, you know, similar, the, the five or six roles and responsibilities for each function, each function can take ownership of writing their processes. And that's when you bring it together and you can optimize. And the first round is normally bad. You know, the process is, it's, it's scrappy, it's messy. People are bringing in pictures here and they're bringing in different ways of doing it. But then once you've got that in place, you can then start scrutinizing each team or each, you know, each of these processes and say, well, now we can improve it. Uh, so I, I, I've, I've got a concept of uh, SFD, which is shitty first draft. It's the first draft you write that you don't care if anybody reads it. You're almost writing it for yourself. And it's a great, another bias for action thing. It's a, it's a great way to get started. Just write something that you don't really care that anyone else sees. So write your process, just get it down. Mm. And once you've got that in place, you can then optimize and you can then clean it and um, finesse it a, a, a little bit. But you can't so optimize what you don't start on, right? And that's the point. Yeah. Ex ex exactly. But a lot of people feel, oh, I don't have time to write the processes. Um, I'll give you an example. I was working with a cyber company uh, a couple of years ago, and they did a lot of high-end consulting. So they charged a lot of money to go and be in front of the customer and do billable work. And they wanted to map their processes. But these guys are, are being paid to do billable work on site with the customer. How are they going to find time to actually go and write all their processes? Mm. But they had an internship program as well. And these interns are coming in. So I just turned around to the, the MD and I said, get the interns to write the processes. <laughs> and he's like, what? You must be joking. I said, no. Get them to shadow the seniors, go on site with the seniors, and write down everything they do. Mm. And then once they've written it down, you know, at the company meeting once a week or whatever, they could actually present those processes to the seniors and the seniors would be like, geez, do I do it that way? Maybe there's a better way. Why am <laughs> yeah. I doing that? And, cool. and because the interns are coming in fresh, fresh eyes, sure, they're not expected to understand the business, the process. But if you just say document what the seniors are doing by through that shadow process, yeah. that, that instills learning both ways very quickly. So the, the interns are feeling valuable because they're actually doing something big for the company. They're writing the, the processes and the seniors are starting mm -hmm. to see the blind spots and between them, they can optimize. That, that so feedback again, you, you just got to, yeah. you just got to, you got to sometimes just be creative in terms of mm. getting the job done. You know? um, I, I want to ask you one question um, about sort of customers and customer onboarding. Um, is there anything that you've learned about sort of customer psychology uh, through what you've now seen, because when you're process mapping and when you're working with organizations, it's all about from their perspective, no matter how customer obsessed you might be, you're still looking at it from things in your shoes, right? But is there anything that goes through your mind or what you've learned or something that might've been surprising along the way, whether it's Amazon or not, that has given you an insight to, to kind of what, what do customers really seek? Now, how do they go about solving their problems? Is there anything interesting in the behavior or some of the psychology that you've maybe unpacked over the over this time? A, a, a few things. Um, firstly, I'm I'm going to quickly go back to to Amazon and that that leadership principle, customer obsession. So I was running a global partner program where we were trying to optimize the way partners were providing Amazon support. We were just trying to you know improve that, and I wrote the document. At Amazon, you don't have PowerPoints and things like that. You have these big working documents, and the document becomes the blueprint. And I thought I'd written a really good document, and I presented it to the team, and they said, and I'm, I'm a customer-obsessed person. Like when I was an operations manager in, in, Ireland, in South Africa and stuff like that, if the phone rang, I'd pick it up, and I'd do whatever I can to solve the customer problem. And I thought that's probably why I got the job there. You know, I was, I was customer-obsessed. But uh, I wrote the document, and in the first paragraphs of the document, I was talking about profitability and what the partners could potentially earn. And they said, you're not thinking about the customer at all. Like the first paragraph, he's starting to talk about the finances and the profit and the GP. 
that's the that we'll figure that out later mm. we'll find ways to make this profitable mm. um and that really got me thinking that you really need to think about that customer journey and experience and what they feel the other thing i really have learned along the, the way is the customer and through my own experience is the customer just wants their expectations managed from the get-go mm. um i'll give you an example i i wanted to go and get laser look at potentially seeing if i could get laser um uh, surgery about a year ago and i went into the i i, I logged on to the clinic on a weekend and said i wanted to get you know have some interest i, I had some interest in, in in getting an appointment they came back immediately with potential appointment dates and then they said here's how it'll work mm. they said you're going to have a three-hour appointment it's quite a process it's going to cost this if you pay this now you book your appointment if you don't pay it you're going to get an appointment um you'll then go through a series of various different tests um you'll arrive 15 minutes before the meeting the meeting starts um, because just in case there's a problem with parking, or whatever, once the meeting starts, you'll be moved to different rooms for various different tests. They're doing pressure and all these different tests. And everything they said in the playbook, they almost sent me a playbook. And then they said, here's the typical FAQs that you may ask along the way. Mm. And here's what's going to happen at the end of the consult. And then make sure you have organized the lift home because we're going to be putting something into your eyes. And you're not going to be able to drive home. And I knew exactly how the meeting was going to go. And then I arrived and it happened exactly like that. Wow. I sat in the reception for 15 minutes. I then got moved from one test to the next test. And then I got given an iPad at one point to go and read up on some stuff before I went to there. Then I had, and it just happened like my, my complete expectation was managed. You know, it was brilliant. You know, that's an example of what good looks like. Mm. And all I, I was told exactly what I was coming in for, it was going to be a slightly uncomfortable process was going to cost me a lot of money um it was going to take three hours out of my time but it happened and it and i kind of warmed up i, I trusted them as a business because their process worked from the get-go and i think that's super important with customers is you want to say we're going to onboard you, you we're going to hand you from sales to to this team uh there's going to be a two-day uh, induction process here there's probably going to be about a week or two while we do the credit vetting and stuff like that before we can actually on if we just manage that and i think if the sales folks in an organization can can tell the customers the process from day one mm. the whole process rather than just trying to sell the feature that makes a huge difference because then the customer knows what that journey is going to look like so you you you, you line yeah. them up for the journey it's, i'll give you another yeah. an, another bad example i signed up for a a virtual app the other day and i was onboarding onto the app it was some some app on the phone it was a coaching app so, uh, i've got a customer that wants me to test something out um and it's a virtual coaching app ai type thing so i thought cool i'll give it a shot and the first step of the app is uh, please take a couple of minutes to onboard yourself because we need to build your wheel of whatever mm. your coaching wheel your personality wheel and it took 20 minutes so the app is telling me it's going to take a couple of minutes. Mm. And then I ended up going through question, 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 because I thought I could do this in between, you know, while the kettle's boiling quickly, like on board before I went to the next meeting. And it took 20 minutes to build this thing. And immediately I've lost faith in the app. My experience is bad because I was mm. told it would take a couple of minutes and it took me 20 minutes to answer the questions. And that's the trust is broken before I've even onboarded onto the app. And it's a it's a great example because I think often we have that with surveys and I've been I've been launching a couple of surveys lately and you know when you want someone to take your survey you're always going to say ah it's just it's just two minutes it's it's not going to take it's the smallest amount of time don't worry and of course it always takes longer and you don't want to mis misrepresent that but you've also got an interest in you know getting what you need done as well yeah. and so the intentions can be good but these things do create that impression in our mind where, yeah. oh, all right, all right, already there's a bad start there versus your experience in the clinic, which was just playbook, you know, material. It was from start yeah. to finish exactly what you expected, what you needed, take my money, no problem. There's almost yeah. something kind of zen in a way about yeah. having a a process that in real life just follows what it says it you know it does on the yeah. tip. and there's it's just yeah. you know straightforward and if you do right by the customer you know like like uh, uh, it says on Amazon you know and you have that bias for action and you're able to just give them what they want give them what they need then the rest of the business will follow you know it's the hand that feeds yeah. 
Exactly. And, and you know what? I, I get the survey thing and everyone just wants to get the job done, but you end up pissing the customer off along the way. And uh, then customers stop wanting to do surveys. But if you if you turn around and say, look, I've, I, we're building this cool thing, but we need to get a profile of you. And that profile is going to take about seven to eight minutes mm. of your time. But it's going to be super once it's done and it's going to give us the information we need. Customers, And then you you deliver that in seven minutes. Customers like, cool. Yeah, totally. no problem. Yeah. Um, but if you kind of say it's going to take a few minutes, just complete this quick survey. It drives me. And I, I like I hang up on people that want to do surveys with me and say that it's just a couple of minutes because I'm like, it's not going to be a couple of minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, so Absolutely. rather just manage the expectations, you know. Yeah, I've I've got another one or two questions, but I do want to check in with John and Bruce if there's anything that's piqued your curiosity in the conversation. If there's a question or a comment. Um, happy to come back to you guys as well if you have okay yeah john no i was actually i wanted to test whether gchat has got a thing where if you put your hand up it does the hand up thing and you don't have to click anything oh really (laughs) that's cool okay no i just you know um just with regards to being like a, a startup and all that kind of thing my wife told me that when they started their live events company you know, they were pretending to be their accounts department and their sales department. And, and there were just two of them. And they would literally like say, please hold for us, our accounts department. And then they'd like put them through and then pick up and like, they're both actors. So would like they do a different, a different voice? And all that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just wonder, you know, um, it's, it's very interesting to think about like just mapping your processes because I find that with, with everything changing so quickly, it's, it's, Every time I get a new pitch or, or I do a treatment on a on a, a new show or for a podcast or whatever it might be, like I end up using a different template every time. Like I'm, I'm mm. just always learning so fast that I, I I'm never in a position where I'm like, cool, this is the way, and this is my process, you know. Um, and I don't know. At my scale, it's more a case of like I guess having templates for stuff like invoices and pitches and and all that kind of thing, but. Yeah, I, I wonder whether, you know, um, like where, where where's the best where's the best place to kind of start working on on working out these or, or I guess writing down these processes. Like, what's the what's the lowest hanging fruit in this for a small startup like me? Yeah, I think look look what what happened with me is I, I had the process think design implement and I kind of built it around that. So when I speak to a customer, I say, "Here's my process." I think we then go into a design stage and implement. The think stage costs whatever, and it's a diagnostics. And at the end of it, you can leave. The design stage is a diagnostics. And at the end of it, you can turn around and say, cool, we've got the plan. We're going to execute on our own. Sure. And you can leave. Right. The implement is a 12 to 24 month commitment. You know, I, I, I don't do three month deals. I don't do six months. It's 12 to 24 months. And um, you can take it or leave it. You know, and so you kind of, you, you illustrate the process. So I think in terms of your question, where do you start? Um if you can illustrate your the way you work with customers, so the first step is, you know, there's an onboarding stage. Then we talk through the 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 templates we create and designing the show, whatever it might be, and then we get into actual production, and then there's a post production piece or whatever whatever it looks like in your business, and you mm-hmm. can illustrate that and you can bring it to the customer at the very beginning. Right. You'll start staying true to your own process. So mm-hmm. the one thing I'll turn around to the customers and say, look. Um, when I've done a discovery call, I said, I will get you a, I, I know that it takes me, if I'm if I'm trying to on, find a new customer, I do a discovery call with a customer. It could take between an hour and an hour and a half. I really get to learn them. Then we get into, you know, we there's an NDA. So I'll sign an NDA because if a customer signs an NDA, they'll tend to commit to doing a little bit more with you. So I said, look, yeah. I'm going to be sharing a lot of information during the diagnostics. You're going to be sharing a lot of information with me. So we want to put an NDA. So I said, first step is we've got to do a discovery call. Then I will get you a an NDA. Then I'll get you a proposal, and it'll be a two-page proposal. And I never go beyond two pages on my proposal. So when they right. get the proposal, it's a two-page proposal. So I, I kind of start bringing how I operate to the customers from the get-go. Right. And they say, okay, well, Alan said he would send me a two-page proposal by the end of the week. He sent me a two-page proposal by the end of the week. Not a four page or a five page. <laughs> and they kind of like yeah, great. this guy kind of this guy kind of gets it. You know, he's yeah. like he's he's always about less is more. He's always trying to reduce. He's keeping mm. things simple. He's not sending me tons and tons of information. He's sending me to the point. And then it's a very clear yay or nay. 
go or no go you know do you want right. do you want to do business so i've kind of refined it when i first started my business i was like umming and eyeing and trying to do all things to everybody and i was like five pages to this customer and then six pages that and i was spending four or five hours in a proposal that i probably wasn't going to win anyway and i decided i just needed to make it a 25 simple. page pitch yes yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so the question you the big question to yourself is how could i have made that pitch a four page pitch mm. um what could what could i take out there and bring the 25 pages in later in the process but only sure. once you knew that it was maybe maybe it's not possible in your business but really like always be optimizing always be looking for mm. if i had to do this 100 times could i afford would i have time to do 25 pitches every time i meet a customer um right. so almost sort of think a little bit bigger and then say, right, if if I had to do that another 10 times, right, would I spend that many hours on it? Probably not. Okay, let's refine right. it. Right. Do you, and, and is in terms of mapping the that that process for the for the customer, I really like that idea. Is that something that you would put on your website in public or is it only something that you would do once the lead is kind of arrived? Once I've got the business? No, oh, I mean to... like if someone contacts you and says you know, I'd like you to, I'd like to make a podcast. Well, how do you work? And then obviously then you, at that point, of course, you would take them through here is an illustrated kind of version of, of how we do the process. But I mean, do you think it would also attract leads if you were clear about that process publicly as well? I mean, because the processes aren't like, you know, they're not particularly secrets or anything like that, no. but very few people uh, illustrate them. Remember that whole, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's probably a lot of people going onto your website or, or engaging with a podcast producer, not knowing how it works. Sure. So by yeah. putting your process there is actually quite quite good, I think. Simplifying, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to put every little bit of detail and scare sure. them off, but you want to say, right, well, here's the four or five steps that it takes to working with a, and and you don't necessarily need to call it your process. You can say ways of working. Um, mm. I, I, you know, our ways of this is how you would work with me. And it was mm. quite interesting. I was listening to a podcast the other day and I forget the name of the guy. I don't know if it was, if it was the CEO of, um, one big tech company, um, mm. if, maybe a document manager, I can't think of the name. And if I can, I'll try and give it to you, Alex, and you can, you know, share it. But, uh, he's a difficult guy to work with. Mm. So he created a playbook on how to work with him. So oh, new right. employees, where they joined, they read the playbook saying, you know, when you reach out to Alex, don't say hi, Alex, on an email, just say Alex, you know, because the little things bugged him. And he kind of set out the little things that make him <laughs> unique with the employees. And then he doesn't have to beat around and worry about walking on eggshells and worrying about offending people or anything, because they know how to work with this guy. He's made it clear, this is how you work with me. And uh, this is how I operate. And there's no blurred lines. Whereas if he didn't, and suddenly he was rude to an employee, the, the employee would have him in front of HR in no time. You know, so he just was was clear. He said, "I'm a unique individual. I'm a bit strange. I've got a strange way of working. So I'm just going to document my way of working so that everybody knows how to work with me." You know, I thought that was pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> the something um, similar here. There's a guy named Evald Horn who's a developer that I I've, I've worked with lightly. He's a similar guy in that if you go to his websites, he's got a a ch like a quiz that you score yourself on and if you don't score enough points he's like don't work don't contact me <laughs> like if you don't have wow. a detailed brief and timelines and you understand your business and its potential profitability there are wireframes and screen designs available so he says yeah. like a plus excellent we should talk six plus there are a few potential issues feel free to review the cheat sheet once more five or less sorry our approaches are too different i do not see us working together you see like it's that's uh, that's ideal. And he knows who he wants to work with. And, mm. you know, he'd rather have 10 great customers that understand his way of working than having to, to navigate all of that. So, yeah, I think it goes back to this customer journey, make it simple for the, for the, uh, yeah. um, for the customers, make them understand how they will work with you. I think that's, yeah, yeah. that that's pretty cool. And then find okay. ways to delight them. I think that's also important as well. Um, I think, you can delight customers in, in 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 small ways, but they make a big difference. Um, we we all know Yuppie Chef used to do the handwritten notes when you ordered mm. something, you know, in South Africa. Um, they were a kitchen, a high end kitchen um, appliance company, and they do handwritten notes. Or if you bought a knife from them, they would put a little coin in the box, you know, because there's a whole tradition around, you know, you give a coin mm. with a knife. Um, so again, just find little ways to delight 
customers. I, I've just come back from South Africa and I flew with Turkish airlines for the first time. And um, the whole experience was phenomenal. And they gave me upgrades. You know, they saw I was tall when I arrived at the airport. I'm six foot three or whatever. And I said, listen, is there any chance of a bit of extra legroom? And they they made it happen for me. And they delighted me. Now, it was the first time using the flight. Maybe they, they've kind of got a little flag in their system saying, make this guy, <laughs> get this guy into premium economy so that yeah, he yeah. orders it next time. You know, I don't know. But um, they found ways to delight me. And um, it, it was great. Whereas, you know, you get on that uh, BA flight to Cape Town from, from the UK and it's, absolutely disaster and it's an old oh yeah it's It's just like it's uh, it's terrible and you get told that you're in group 20 and you got to hang around at the back i I know it's just a horrible experience and um you know you 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 get you find ways to delight um even the customers that aren't on spending that's why yeah that's why these industries are just being disrupted left right and center specifically in the airline space you know you've you've got so much room for better customer experience that uh yeah it's no wonder that the market share has gone the way it has um i just love but it is tricky it it is tricky uh, alex as well because i mean again if i look at emirates years ago emirates used to be the same they'd be a cheap i think an airline starts its business with a lot of funding and a lot of delighting and then Mm -hmm. over time they just become expensive and take the delight away that's true um you know i used to fly emirates um because they were affordable and i could go anywhere in the world with them um, but I don't anymore because they're not affordable and they're not the first choice when you um, right, it does change. Oh God. They've got to make they've got to make real money now. It's not uh, it's not uh, funded money that they're spending. Yeah. No. I wanna um just quickly check in with Bruce. Yeah, if you've got um thanks, Alex. Alan, I'm interested in any advice and guidance you'd give the community in terms of the 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 focus point here is overcoming internal resistance to documenting these processes Um, in these smaller, um, medium-sized businesses. You know, there's a lot of um, kind of corporate immune system to we don't have time. um, That you know, by the time we write it, it's going to be changing anyway because we're a very evolving, developing business. Um, You know, there's a there's a a whole raft of reasons that um, people don't want to do it. Part of it is skill set. You know, they're not used to it. They don't know how to do it. They don't know what to do. So businesses are not coming in with, you know, here's the framework, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So what guidance would you give us to to removing resistance to ensuring that those very important um, processes are put in place? I think the first thing is... I'm just trying to think about how to frame this best. Um, I mean, the example of the, the 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 telling them that it's a book and that everybody in the org chart writes part of the process, you breaking it down into small chunks. So I think the guidance would be start as small as you possibly can, but delegate the work as much as you possibly can. So if you go into small business, I'm, I'm assuming a small business might have five functional leaders. Would that be right? Or could it be even smaller? Probably yes. Yes. I mean, less than okay. hundred employees. Okay. So less than hundred employees the, and and they're all busy and they don't want to write the process and they're saying that our business is moving so fast that we don't. The whole idea is, you know, the processes might help them change the way they shape their business as well. So by having the processes, that's actually a benefit. Um, but you don't have to write every single thing. I think what you could turn around and say, right, we want a playbook or an operating book for our business. So the playbook is business. Here's where we want to go. Here's our big goal. This is the thing that makes us um, unique. Here are our values. And here are our, our one, two, three-year goals. This is where we want to go as a business. And that becomes the, the 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 introduction to the book. And then we say, right, we've got our organizational chart. And I think I spoke about this already. And the organization or the accountability chart has a head of sales, head of finance, um, head of technology, and a partner manager, whatever it is. Each of those have five responsibilities under those. And you don't have to list 10 or 100 responsibilities. It's not a job description, just the five or six key responsibilities. And then you just say to each of those functional owners, just write down three or four processes for each of those responsibilities. So if you're onboarding customers and the the lead process, what is your lead process? So the lead process is we we either get organic leads in, we get referrals. um, When a lead comes in, we then assign it in a ticket to our salesperson. Just three or four steps. Start with that have the bones once they get that shitty first draft in place they'll actually want to start filling in the blanks you 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 kind of 
Is that making sense? I'm answering your question because it, it, no, you absolutely. kind of you, you you need to you can't say to one person, okay, uh, John, you you're the guy that's going to write all the processes. So go and write all the processes and go and work with each of those functional owners and ask them what their processes are because the functional owners are going to give them the middle finger. You've got to make it something that the functional owners can write themselves quickly or or delegate to an assistant or delegate to somebody on their team to write. Like I explained with the cybersecurity, getting the interns to to shadow the seniors and write the processes. Um, so I think that the main thing is if you've got a very good org chart in place or accountability chart in place, um, that's a very easy step to go and write the process because you can take those functional owners and say to them, write, write down the five the, the five key responsibilities you have, write a process for each of those responsibilities or write three or four processes for them. Like so so that's that's what I would what I would say to you is break it down. Don't give it to one person. The other one is get creative, is, is just get um junior members of the team or, or new members of the team to shadow old members of the team and just get them during their onboarding stage or their induction stage just to document what that team does. Um, Great. Thank you. I have two other questions, if I may. Sure. Um, one is there's always an assumption that um, you put people in a job and they're able to do the entire job, which is primarily not true, right? There's parts that they excel at, there's parts that they can get, a, get around with, and there's parts that they, they are exceptionally poor at, uh, but they're still required to do the, the spherical part of their job. When it comes to this process that you're talking about now, the delegation of it, you know, this is your part, um, what would you advise people to do when they come across someone that is simply very challenged to do this sort of thing? They are a functional leader, but this type of process is extremely difficult for them to do from a uh, skill perspective. So so they're a functional leader. So the, their responsibility is to to lead the function, to own to that del function. To deliver the sales, to deliver the finance, to deliver operations, to deliver whatever it may be. And they're yeah. very good at what they do. Yeah. But when it comes to writing processes and thinking in this kind of way, um, they're very challenged. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I, I kind of I, I, I challenge why they're a functional leader. You know, you got you got to deliver the sale. So, what is your process for delivering the sale? Um, you go companies that less than have less than one hundred people are stuck with this type of scenario quite yeah. a lot. But the functional leader is very good at doing something, but they weren't employed to write this kind of thing. So, I come across this periodically, and I'm kind of like, there are ways around it. But I'm I'm wondering whether you have any kind of, um insights as to other than replacement <laughs> yeah um because it may not be possible are there are, yeah. are there ways of wiggling through this i kind of i kind of get it i mean again i've worked with sales teams as well and i've been a sales leader and um getting your business development executive that plays golf every day to start writing processes it's 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 near impossible um but i think you need to say you, you've kind of almost got a coerce them into the benefits of the process you can say right don't you hate it when you've you've just landed a big deal and then find that the guys in engineering dropped the ball for you um or that you've just onboarded a customer and they've, they're ringing you up for customer support every five minutes because um you haven't that they, they haven't been onboarded properly onto the support side so i think we're just interested in your process of onboarding a customer so that we can actually see where there may be blind spots where other teams can actually you know sh sh share you i i I don't know. I mean, it's it's. I suppose it's down to personality and understanding the person. But but you you also want to say to them, look, the, the customer is with us for a long period of time. We onboard that customer, or we 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 sell to that customer. We need to make sure that we can keep that customer for two or three years. Because if if we spend a whole lot of marketing budget on that customer um, to get them in the door, and they leave within a early period of time, um, we've lost money as a business. We're out of business. So we've got to we've got to increase that customer lifetime value. And the way to do that is to delight them from the get-go. And to delight them, we need to, our engineering teams and our onboarding teams need to understand the sales process and you need to understand their, their, their processes. So by you just documenting how you engage with the customer, how you onboard with the customer, you're actually benefiting the, it, the, the greater good of the company. I, I don't know, it's it, it, it's a tough one. I, I kind of understand your conundrum, but uh I, I persevere with it and I try and I just find ways um, with the guys. Um, I, I, and again, this is the the rigor that was built through my time at Amazon and through my time working with as a CEO and companies is 
every part of the business needs to be operationalized. They've, they've got to do it. And in an organization, even with 100 people in a sales or yes, your business development might director may say, well, sorry, I'm not going to write processes. But that person's going to have a sales admin person in the business who can shadow them and actually get those things done. So there, there, there is a way. Right. Yeah. Thank you. The last question, if I may, is um, businesses are growing or the business is growing is developing to the point that what are the signs that they should, they could be aware of that they need someone like you to step in and help them get to that next point? I think some of the signs are uh, staff, when they start growing, a lot of smaller businesses say our retention rates are good for, for staff. Everybody stayed because it's the founding team and sometimes the founding team have equity and that's why they've stayed. But suddenly you're getting to 50, 100 people and you're finding that people are coming in the door and they're going out the door six months later. So the first thing is, the first thing I see is, you know, does your your staff retention rate start slipping um, and staff leaving? The other one is when they need to, they're bringing people into the organization. So they're having to create, when you get to 30 people or so, you're now starting to bring in specialists. So you might have a product specialist or you might start bringing certain services in-house. So a business under 50 people, for example, doesn't need in-house HR. They'd probably outsource that. And they've got an outside company that actually goes and does some of the HR stuff. A business that starts growing beyond 50 people probably brings an HR person or people operations person into the business. Same with marketing. You'll outsource your marketing and agencies, you know, to agencies. And then when you get to a certain size where you're needing to go into new territories, you bring in a marketing manager. So as you start having to bring in new functions, um, you're bringing in experts or hiring in new people that are coming in and working alongside the existing people. And remember, the existing people are those scrappy startup interns that started, those college guys that started running around, going to events, doing things, learning on the job. Now suddenly are very put off by these structured people that have either come from corporate or from other companies where there's been a bit more structure. So uh that's when 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 you start seeing um um challenges between an existing manager and a new manager coming in and then the other thing as well is retention you want to keep staff so you want to keep your engineers your 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 lead engineers or your lead developers especially in a tech company uh by making them managers so you say right we're going to keep you we're going to have to pay you 25% more you're going to now look after the rest of the team so you 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 almost over promoting you're moving individual contributors into management roles far too soon without giving them the proper management training. Um, those are all the warning signs. And then also when your co-founders um, are just are becoming bottlenecks, because as you grow bigger and you've got 100 people and 100x customers, the decisions that you have to make every day, 10x. And suddenly these co-founders just can't, they, they stop making decisions. So what you need to start doing is actually delegating those decisions down as much as possible to the organization. And that's when you actually start testing the delegation skills. Can these founders actually delegate properly? Um, or does every decision still need to go to them? Um, so those are the sort of the, the, the creaks. And some, some founders enjoy the chaos and they, they, they work their way through it. Others want it to be smoother. So they bring somebody in like me to help with the operations. Great. Thank you very much. Awesome. Wow. Um, this has been a great conversation. I've, I've really enjoyed this. I, I, I've just got one more question, and I suppose it would be slightly remiss of me if I didn't mention the the AI topic. Um, and we have a sort of an unwritten rule here, Alan, on Humble Mind. Every time someone says chat, meh, 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 got to buy, uh, buy the whole community a round of cappuccinos. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so really, but my, my question comes from, you know, we've talked a lot about creating and, and crafting processes and looking at operations as a mindset and all of these things. And there's something underpinning all of that, which is that it's a it's an inherently human uh, kind of element that drives all of this forward, right? Because it's about being customer obsessed and it's about at some point being able to bring in the premium of a customer solving their problem if they can't do it themselves or automatically online then there's the ability to have it solved by another human being or there's 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 some kind of meeting of minds that needs to happen but now if we look at ai and processes more and more being kind of automatically delegated i happen to do a little bit of work on the side for a um uh, a, a life and health insurance technologies company and they sell directly to the providers and they've got some very sophisticated 
very impressive technology that helps to do all of the digital twinning and the decision making uh, where there's no human intervention needed based on claims and requests that come through from customers. And so, uh, yeah, just general blue sky kind of, uh, you know, any principles, any thoughts you have on does AI have a role to play here? Is there always going to be a a kind of a, a human driven edge to operations as a focus in a business? Or do you think it's something that we can just whack into a couple of AI tools and uh, and take care of? Uh, for us much better than humans can. Well, where do you sit on that? Look, I think I think AI is another tool, right? I, I, I also, you noticed right through this conversation, I haven't mentioned AI once, but another way, Bruce. Impressive. And Bruce, another way that I would potentially help get that sales guy that doesn't want to write processes to write processes is stick something into chat, say, write the playbook for business development in a services company operating in the in EMEA territory. Done. And then you give it to that business development guy and say, look, what are we, what, what doesn't work on this playbook? Um, and then that they can very, it's very easy for them to work on something existing. So, so yeah, the tools are, are, are great for operationalizing things and writing playbooks and they, they're not bad. I mean, you, you can go in there. Um, Decision-making is important, but I think the important thing for me with AI, with the way the future is going, have you ever heard of the concept of the and on court? No. So Toyota started this on their production line that basically they empowered every single employee to stop the production line if there was a problem. So it wasn't a question of something's going to go wrong. They had this cords that used to hang from the thing. They're called an and on cord. And if you pull that cord, it stops the production line. And then the manager goes onto the floor, they figure out the problem, they solve the problem. So in an AI world, and we've seen this in banking, you know, these neo banks and everything like that, where you don't engage with a pillar, a pillar type bank, you never meet a bank manager, all decisions are made, your credit decisions, everything's done AI. Humans and customers need to be able to pull that and on cord. And when that cord gets pulled, a human gets involved. And if you're ringing an insurance company and the AI bot is guiding you through your policy, but you feeling at any time that you need to speak to a human, there should be a speak to human button. And when that speak to human button happens, the AI should contextualize where you are in the journey. Okay, you're talking about a credit card problem, so you want to speak to somebody in the credit card team. Within three or four rings, a human should pick up the phone. That's going to make it work really well. And I think companies need to focus on not necessarily having the humans in the call centers to answer every question, but having the humans when escalation is needed. So I, it's the concept of the and on cord. And I think with AI and with all this deci- d- um, you know, decision making being done and AI running it, you, you, you want a human to be able to sort of engage when needed. Does that answer the yeah, question? Yeah, no, it's yeah. it's a brilliant answer because it, it it reflects a principle that you're bringing into it. And I think that's often missing when it comes to how people are, often company leaders in, in various different industries are trying to apply AI where it's it's not problem focused or it's not sort of principle yeah. focused. It's just like, let's just plug it into every hole. You know, let's just yeah. see if we can get AI into every single conversation. But rather, if you look, if you're giving it an application first off, and then approaching AI, then I think not only are you going to be more likely to be successful yeah. with that application, but then you're also you're, you're using it to solve a problem rather than yeah. it just being a novelty. I mean, I, I see it on the VC circuit at the moment, especially around Dublin and everything. Everybody talks about we're an AI company. No, you're not. You're a company that does whatever you do, leveraging AI tools. Um, and I think people need to realize that you know companies 10 years ago leveraged Microsoft or they leveraged a scanner, or they leveraged a printer, because that was the technology at the time. Um, now the technology at the time is AI. So you're a car insurance company that leverages some AI to make some decision-making to get your, your insurance quicker. You're not an AI company. And I hate that. It drives me mad when people say something that an AI company and all the investors get excited. And I think a year or two ago, the VCs were throwing money at companies with the word AI in them. I don't think that's happening anymore. <laughs> I think the, the, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Let let's see. Sorry, I mean, have I just upset the whole community like with one sweeping not statement? At there now? <laughs> not at all. It's not at all. It's. I just realized the the, the invite here said um, AI in in an AI world, and I've, I've I've spent most of this hour talking about everything other than AI. No, so. no, no. It's uh, it's it's uh, you've got the very much the right approach, and I think most of the community would agree with you on that. That um, you know we we still have a role to play, a very important role, and uh, AI is a tool, not the not the end. It's a means, you know. 
Um, yeah. But, but yeah, it's it's been a fabulous conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. I'm and, and I'm sure everyone else will when they when they listen back and um, and check out the clips that we'll put up on Humble Mind soon as well. Uh, but thank you, thanks for your time, Bruce and John. Appreciate it. Yeah, dude, uh, thank you very much, Alan. Guys as well. Yeah. Thanks for joining us on Humble Mind. Once again, if you're curious to check us out, what our community is all about and what we do on a weekly basis, have a look at our website and join us at humblemind.co. Until next time.